Hey, welcome back everyone for the Q&A of the CloudSec block. Uh, we are here with our speakers uh, that you just listened to, but also a newcomer, uh, Magno Logan from Trend Micro. Um, Magno, you're a security specialist and a threat researcher. Uh, you pretty much work with cloud uh, containers and threat modeling, but you're also doing a, a very interesting workshop right after this Q&A about Kubernetes and uh, the best practices. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure, Max. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, in this workshop, we're, we're going to assume no, no, no prior knowledge of Kubernetes. We're going to build a cluster from scratch. We're going to deploy a, a vulnerable web application and we're going to attack it and understand what happened there with the attack and why was that possible. And then we're going to implement certain countermeasures and protections on that cluster to avoid that attack, attack from happening again. Thanks. And you're doing that on, uh, for the sake of everyone, on AWS EPS, which is the uh, semi managed. Uh, Kubernetes servers from from Amazon. Yes, that's right. So yeah, we're so launching. let's start with uh, uh, a few questions. We uh, a couple uh, for each of the talks. So you go ahead, uh, Magna. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you're breaking right, up. So you can go ahead if you want to talk about your... Sure. Uh, so yeah, we're we're using EKS, and to do that, first we're going to create a, a, a Cloud9 instance, which is basically a virtual desktop inside AWS, like a a, a, a virtual VS Code, you may say, uh, so that we can. Uh, everyone can have the same configurations and the same uh, uh, same environment, right? So we don't run into any issues with VMs or, or, or any problems installing stuff on your machine. So first we spin we spin up the Cloud9 instance, and from there we create the EKS cluster, right? So everything is is on AWS. That's why it's important that uh, prior to the workshop starts, you have an AWS account. Right, so at least that's that's all you need, a valid AWS account. Of course, it should be one that's separated from everything that you're doing. Don't don't use your work AWS or, or anything that you have any, any production systems running, right? This is going to be a, a workshop. We're gonna to play around with things. So we don't wanna make sure, we wanna make sure that we don't compromise any other systems there. Perfect, thanks. And for the record, uh, the word, that workshop is at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, so in about 45 minutes. Um, so let's, um, let's start with some questions. Um, I have some regarding uh, Evelyn's talk. Um, there's a... Um, we have a question about uh, password managers and um, the, the question is as follow. Uh, what do you see in the role of password managers in addressing in terms of password reuse, uh, but also shadow ITs and especially what you mentioned about zombie accounts, uh, like you call them? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that's a great question. So first of all, password manager definitely helps solve the password reuse problem, but only solve part of the problem, not completely solving the zombie account problem. And let's look at what are the problem is solved and what are the problem it does not. So the good thing about a password manager is that it's a side unique and randomized password for the user for each application, right? And auto fill the password for the user whenever they need to log on. So periodically, the only thing the user of a password manager will need to remember is the master password. So that's significantly solve the problem of reusing password. But then there are some professional grade password manager, but there are some really so-and-so acceptable to use password manager. So 
a professional one should store all the application passwords in a very secure location, like uh, the key train of your mobile device and like the credential manager of your window OS, for example, right? This kind of key train should be tamper-proof uh, in the hardware chip. But a bad password manager is not the same, right? They can just save <laughs> all your password in a local storage in pin text, no encryption, which means that if your device like mobile or PC got compromised, it's even worse because the attacker can get all your application password in a single file. So, so, so the problem is that a password manager also does not really solve the zombie problem completely unless you integrate it um, with a centralized identity management inventory. So I think the best way to do it is first, choose a very good password manager. And secondly, integrate it with the centralized federation service in the corporate environment. So, uh, which means that the employee should use a single password manager and then they single sign on into that password manager. And this password manager will help to memorize all the external SaaS application password for the actual user. So the actual user does not need to remember anything, not even the master password of the password manager, just like you're signing into it, and the password manager help to log on to everything. There are some pretty good commercial products in the market to solve the problem. Uh, if you look at CyberArk, uh, Beyond Trust, um, sometimes people also refer to the commercial version of LastPass um, can help to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, following to uh, Philip's um, talk, someone's asking if HRS applies to network appliances, if you've seen it, or uh, if you've been able to exploit it as well. Uh, there's a lot of enterprises, a lot of businesses that put uh, network appliances in front of their either their cloud or their application and so on. Uh, so is is HRS affected by those, or is it mostly like uh, software proxies like uh, HA proxy and others? Yeah, it depends what we uh, we mean by uh, network appliances. Uh, obviously, it needs to have a proxy component for HTTP. Um, the thing I would mention regarding appliance and provider in general, at the moment, uh, if there you would have one thing to test either for your appliance or uh, provider is the last attack I mentioned regarding HTTP2. Uh, there was a recent article saying most cloud provider, um, some have fixes where they simply block the HTTP2 upgrade, um, but most provider at the moment have uh, refused to respond to a question from a port trigger and they don't want to give a status of is it fixed or not. So it's giving a good tip that most provider are not yet uh, covering this. So um, if it's a proxy that just uh, detects and blocks requests that are malicious, usually if it's requests that are initiated by your uh, user internally, you shouldn't be too much uh, worry about request uh, smuggling, but if it's an appliance that is between the web to your uh, web server, then you should be testing for uh, request smuggling because the the threat makes sense. Um, Thanks, and, and maybe I could following uh, that question really. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I was going to answer uh, the second question for uh, HRS. Uh, yeah, sure. Maybe? Some, somebody mentioned uh, uh, what the, st the standards say regarding multiple content length. Um, I guess they, they refer to uh, HTTP standard. I'm not sure what is the exact answer to this uh, regarding what, what the standards say, but uh, usually it's the kind of thing where it's not explicitly mentioned all the condition uh, like this. But uh, one thing I could say, there is a recent warranty where uh, multiple content could be accepted. There, there is a CV for it on a Python component. So it's a proxy uh, for a Python, uh, Python framework. The thing you need to be aware of is that even though there's a CV and it's um, saying it's exploitable with Iris because it's uh, HRS, uh, you need to have a, a backend server. So uh, your Nginx or Apache server that is supporting content length. And since 2005, there is no uh, uh, web server that support uh, double content length. They will mark those as uh, 
for bad requests. So uh, even if your proxy is supporting double content length, at the moment, these are the kind of condition that uh, uh, are just not supported by uh, most uh, web container. So uh, you shouldn't be worried too much about the double content length, uh, even if your uh, proxy is uh, something that has a, a known CV, but make sure you have do, you're doing your update. But yeah, so this is something if you are te doing tests and you want to test the exploitability of a certain uh, CV, uh, sometime the proxy might be known to have a vulnerability, but it will not be exploitable because the backend, when it will see something fishing, the request will just mark it as bad request. So that was for the question from uh, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thanks. Um, some questions for uh, our friend Renzon. Um, have you used CAPE or any other forensic tools um, in, in your research? Um, I, I always use CAPE uh, in some of the predominant uh, cloud storage applications, but some of the enterprise tools such as um, Axiom, Magnet Forensics, um, Celebrite can easily do the job on other platforms. So I have to check if own cloud and next cloud has uh, a separate module for these enterprise tools. But uh, yeah, give, give Eric Zimmerman like a couple of months or probably just weeks and then he'll probably make a parser out of it. So I have to check on that, um, Tom. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Tom. And following question regarding clouds you've tested, have you tried iCloud? Um, there, there was a great presentation by a different um, DFIR folks related to iCloud already. So uh, I just I can just share the link uh, in our Discord channel uh, just to just to answer these questions. So I'm primarily working in a Windows environment right now, but due to my uh, uh, new gigs, uh, I have to dig, dig time into a Mac forensics too. So probably I'll just do it um, also this year. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that would be great. Maybe you can show us uh, next year, you know? Yeah, we'll see. Um, Evelyn, I had some, some question regarding your work on authentication. Um, we're starting to see a, a lot more of IDP being centralized, uh, naming Azure B2B, for instance, uh, or IODC and so on. Have you seen those being implemented in B or how, how do you see uh, the way they can help centralize even better than that? Yeah, I think uh, centralized IDP is extremely important but we also need some level of segregation, right? So um, Azure adp 2 c is meant for the external client uh, to the company. But I do think, uh, you know, to manage the internal employee identity, we need a segregate identity store. So uh, there are different technology we can leverage. In terms of Azure AD B2B, which is a very good example, we try to solve the problem that, um, if there are two companies, they are partner, and I want to let, for example, my vendor to get into my company network in the past, is, I would say it's quite messy, right? Um, and it's also really important to securely manage all the vendor that helping us to do the job and do some troubleshooting. So um, B2B solution in general, not only Azure, is so important for us to centralizely manage or our supplier where they need to go into the corporate environment. So they are not exactly the external client, they are not internal employee, they are the supplier. So um, I think that's the new trend. Um, very happy to see this kind of technology evolving. Great, thanks. Um, maybe more generalized questions uh, for Magno, maybe Renzen even, and Philip. Um, more and more we see the apps developed in the cloud that are multi tier through different technologies, Kubernetes, HAProxy, and so on in front, presentation layers, and so on. Um, what do you, do you feel like one side of, uh, of a tech is especially more emphasized towards security and one being left alone? Um, we talked a lot about um, uh, storage being self-hosted here with I, 
um, with Cloud Now and uh, even uh, Google Drive and so on, but uh, Azure buckets are being left alone in that category or same way with EKS versus uh, a standalone um, service like uh, just running Kubernetes on uh, machine uh, and virtual machines and so on. Um, what I mean is that there's, you know, throughout layers of your application, do you feel like, especially for cloud security, is one layer being more attributed to and emphasized on compared to others? Should I answer the question? Sorry, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. It's hard to. Uh, it's a long question, so if you can try to shorten it, and that might be better. Uh, so, so the question is, you know, when you consider a web application like Philip described, how uh, do you feel that there people put emphasis on um, on different technologies rather than others? Uh, usually your security is as good as your weakest link. Uh, and do you feel that there is a weakest link usually when you build web applications and so on? Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so there's something, uh, right? When we start building the cloud and adding new layers, right? Adding containers and Kubernetes, right? All that stuff, you need to understand what's behind it, right? What's in the background, what, what kind of uh, dependencies you have, libraries and, and other services that you rely on so that you make sure that those are safe as well, right? So for example, there is a recent vulnerability that was released, I think uh, two days ago about uh, on Run C, right? And Run C is pretty much on, on every Docker container and pretty much on every Kubernetes cluster, right? So uh, on almost every Kubernetes cluster, right? So you need to realize that because you're, this is not a Kubernetes vulnerability. It's a run C vulnerability that makes your containers run, right? So you need to understand that. So I think the the ability to have a, a, a much more supply chain attacks, right? If you may say that it, it's, it's larger in the cloud because it's harder for you to have a visibility on what's in the background. So I think with the cloud and cloud native approach, um, they, they say that to have a proper security, you have to secure the four layers. You have to secure the four Cs. So you have to secure the cloud, right? You have to secure the cluster. You have to secure the container, right? And there is one more C, I think, that you have to secure the code. So yeah, cloud, cluster, container, and code. So those are the four Cs or four layers that you need to focus on because the, it, it's not just protecting one layer, you need to protect all of them, right? Exactly, right, I just wanna, yeah, I just wanna add something about that. Uh, just a couple of reminders that API keys are also uh, being leveraged by, by different adversaries and also misconfigurations. And lastly, the IAM or the identity access management from the cloud perspective is so huge. So you gotta make sure that uh, you're gonna keep up on securing this, this kind of approach too. Thank you. Um, following question with uh, Philip Stock, uh, you, you talked about HTTP1 vulnerability. Uh, you mentioned you didn't really have time to do a demonstration for HTTP2. Uh, are you able to talk more about this? What's the difference between the two and are they So the main difference is that uh, from what I've seen and uh, from what I've test, uh, HTTP one, there are multiple risks and attacks. So when I mention cache poisoning, um, being able to bypass URL filtering, but also XSS and um, connection hijacking. In, with HTTP two uh, vector, it's mainly bypassing uh, URL filtering. So uh, with the proof of concept that were released late last year, uh, capability to Let's say your host is a company that come and you want to blacklist a slash test or a, maybe a domain that is internal with the new exploit uh, request smuggling with HTTP2. What it allow you is to visit paths that were blocked and um, 
but also potentially hosts that are not exposed externally. So the, the way it works is really uh, you're not affecting directly a request from other user, but you're getting a, um, a direct link with um, the, the web server. So in a nutshell, I won't do a, a, a long explanation, but basically you're doing an handshake that is similar to WebSocket. So all in clear text, all in HTTP, but at the end, you're uh, communicating in, with in, in HTTP2. And if your proxy recognize the upgrade from HTTP2 to uh, clear, uh, HTTP2 clear text, it will simply uh, forward everything. So if it has this feature, uh, and same goes for WebSocket, uh, you'll probably be able to bypass uh, filtering to internal host and uh, path. So that's the main vector for HTTP2. So no uh, XSS or uh, no uh, connection hijacking from what I saw. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question about uh, Kubernetes secrets. Um, really, uh, Magno, what's your what's your take on this? What's the way to uh, do you have any thoughts on the way secrets are managing KS? I'll as well. That would be great. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I don't want to say too much, or otherwise I might be spoiling for those attending the workshop, right? But yeah, right. just one thing to be aware is that uh, secrets in Kubernetes are not really secret by default, right? They're just base64 encoded, which basically, as you may know already, you can easily revert it, right? So to, to properly... Uh, secure your secrets on Kubernetes, you need to uh, do some extra stuff that, that's not enabled by default. So you need to have uh, create an encryption configuration object, apply that to your etcd cluster uh, where, where all the, the components of Kubernetes are stored. And that's when it's going to encrypt that sensitive information or secrets, right? So uh, nowadays, if you don't know how to do that or think that's, that's gonna be a problem, you should probably use a third party uh, uh, secret management, right? Either from your own mm -hmm. cloud provider or, or something like HashiCorp Vault or, or something like that, right? So that's the recommendation there. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question mixing, again, multiple subjects. Um, on assuming you have a Kubernetes infrastructure, how does request smuggling react? Is it easier, harder to attack and use? Uh, Philip? Yeah, to, to be honest, I didn't have time to do any tests with uh, Kubernetes, so I'm not fully aware of the implication uh, and how the Kubernetes proxy uh, react to uh, these type of payloads. So uh, sorry, I can't respond to, to this question. No worries, thanks. Um, I have uh, more questions of my own, if you guys, if you guys allow me. Um, maybe for, for Renzon, uh, you know, when we talk about cloud storage, cloud, cloud storage as a whole, as a service, it's been around for almost 15 years now. It's one of the very first services we've seen from AWS, for instance, with three. How do you feel and uh, how do you feel how they, they've evolved through time? Uh, do you think it drastically improved? Do you, what do you think there's still to do regarding this? Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to answer this from a forensic standpoint. So uh, storage itself is uh, one of the things that we're trying to look for uh, when, try when we're trying to get um, some fundamentals in artifacts, when we're trying to analyze uh, things. And um, uh, when you talk about cloud storage uh, from, from the cloud storage services that I've mentioned in my talk, uh, there is actually a difference between uh, different services such as Google Drive. If you deleted something in Google Drive, that would be there forever. 
So once you delete it, of course, that's going to be on the recycle bin. And then not every users are aware that it's not going to delete automatically. It's going to be there unless you have um, a full drive, uh, like you're going to you max out your storage itself, and then uh, you probably empty the trash. But um, I just, when I try and do some research, um, I saw some of my old files even 2013 and 2014 up until now. So pretty much um, maybe users needs to be aware of, of, of the retention policy of every um, cloud providers out there so that you, you don't want to mess up with the old files that could potentially have sensitive informations or personal informations of, 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 of yourself. So that, that's gonna be it. Great, thanks. Uh, maybe follow up on that. Uh, we've seen in recent years, the arrival of new services and new features such as Casby, a DLP feature, data protection on Office 365, you have it in Google Drive now and so on. Um, have you had a chance to test those? Uh, do you have any thoughts on how they evolved until today and what remains to be done with them? Um, hmm, good question. So uh, from the enterprise side of these cloud storage services, uh, they're kind of flexible now on uh, what you want to, to log or um, for example, let's say AWS in Azure. So like Azure, uh, as per my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, um, not everything could be logged. But from the AWS standpoint, Pretty much everything that you do from 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 the cloud um, instance, it will be logged, and like even you modified something, you delete, you rename something, it will be logged. So it's it's still not perfect as of the moment from security standpoint, but um, I think um, the granularity of different log types could be uh, a massive changes in the next future. Thank you. Uh, maybe a question regarding all of you. Uh, it's, we talked about it with Evelyn's talk. Um, zero trust is becoming more and more popular. Uh, with COVID, we have people working from home. Uh, storage is now centralized in the cloud. We're going to move towards zero trust, towards bring your own devices and so on, and decentralize their actual documents, data, and so on. All right. Um, may you repeat the question? I, I, I understand the problem statement, but... Uh... Yeah. yeah sure. The question is just: Do you see zero trust becoming more and more popular in the, you know, in twenty twenty two and so on? Yeah, of uh, course. Considering think, yeah. you know, COVID is still there. Definitely, I I would say yes. Um, it's not an easy problem to solve, but I think the good thing is that when we move a lot of things to cloud we can use the uh, machine learning and intelligence better. So we are more ready to embed the um, zero trust model, which we couldn't do it before because uh, in the past, we just shut our door. We use firewall policy to, to put the control. And with the zero trust model, uh, we just do the same thing, but smarter. We enforce the policy uh, dynamically instead of you know just some fixed firewall policy. Yeah, definitely, yes, in my opinion. And on the Renzo side, do you see, you know, um, uh, these these cloud storage expanding more and more, and you need them to store more confidential data. A lot of uh, big enterprises are against using the cloud for these specific reasons, right? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Max? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> so, 
So I was just asking if um, uh, if you see a cloud storage being expanded further, further using uh, confidential data by enterprises and so on, do you think they're gonna go towards that path even though they have, um, they're not necessarily open to it necessarily today? Um, yeah, there, there's actually um, a feature called files on demand. So that's uh, one of the great features of cloud storage services, wherein um, essentially if you install um, an application of a cloud storage and an endpoint, it, um, there is a, yeah, files on demand can be um, like most of the files that you have in cloud, uh, you, you don't need to store it locally. So that saves you a lot of time, but from the user side, they can access it anytime they want. Um, so that's one thing that, um, potentially be a big thing uh, as well. They can expand it more farther. So uh, cloud storage, um, I can see a huge um, um, or exponential growth into that. This is not really a common topic that has been discussed from, uh, from, from InfoSec community, but there could be a large footprints. And also this could be a very good thing uh, when we are dealing with different type of incidents, um, so and so forth. Thanks, Renzan. Um, again, thanks everyone for the for the Q and A and your talks. Um, I hope people are interested in the Kubernetes workshop as well. Uh, this looks super interesting. Thanks for your time and uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you.